Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy Thursday. Welcome to the last pre-stated presser of 2019 and of this decade. Uh, we had a busy year and uh, it was productive and I think 2020 is going to be equally as productive. First, let's talk about the today's stated agenda. We are voting on the following two land use items. Uh, two applications in Councilmember Bill Perkins' district, La Hermosa, a rezoning to facilitate a development of a mixed-use building, allowing for the expansion of a new residential tower, and MMN 1902 117th Street, which is a tax exemption that will enable much-needed repairs for three buildings and the preservation of 41 units of affordable housing. Lastly, there's a citywide POPs text amendment, which would update the existing public space symbol and permit movable tables and chairs to be placed in plazas. And out of the Finance Committee, we'll be voting on an expense budget modification, a revenue budget modification, and a capital budget modification. On the expense budget modification side, we are really pleased to see some of the changes uh, reflected in this mod that will effectuate some of the important funding that was part of the budget agreement back in June. In particular, the budget mod includes $54 million for the indirect rate increase for human service contracts so that our nonprofit partners can better afford to provide the vital services on which their constituents rely on every day. We rely on these nonprofits to help New Yorkers get the services they need to thrive. They should not have to scramble to pay bills. There are partners in keeping our city great. The MOD also shows funding for the pay parity agreement for three critical public sector workers, including $29 million for the early childhood education providers and $7.4 million for legal service providers so that these workers are paid fairly. This was a really important issue, as you remember, in our budget negotiations earlier this year. The council was clear that we needed to close these pay gaps. We needed to work towards a more just and fair city, and we are, so we are uh, proud that we, the council, put these valuable workers on the path towards pay parity, and we'll also be voting on five Article 11 property tax exemptions for affordable housing developments, including William R. Anderson and Councilmember Levine's district, 1632, some members come on this side, uh, 1632, uh, River Parkway East on Council, in Councilmember Jonai's district, 1414 Walton Avenue in Councilmember Cabrera's district, 254 East 84th Street in Councilmember Torres's district, Evergreen and Tiebout Pillars in Councilmember Torres's district, and moving on, the council will be voting on the following pieces of legislation. First, we have a pre-considered introduction to co-name 55 thoroughfares in public spaces based on the request of council members whose district the street sign will be located. Of these 55 names, five are either five are either a relocation of the previously enacted co-naming or a revision to the street sign installed with respect to a previously enacted co-naming. And before I get to the package of bills, other bills we're voting on today, we're joined by council members Traeger, Richards, Drum, Miller, and Kalos. The first uh, from the Civil Service and Labor Committee includes resolution number 40A sponsored by Councilman Robert Cornegie, which calls on New York City Employees Retirement System, NICERS, to determine that members are, quote, disabled for purposes of receiving disability benefits if, first, the State Workers' Compensation Board determines the member has a permanent partial disability, and second, the U.S. Social Security Administration determines that the member is disabled for substantial work activity and approved for Social Security disability benefits. Next, by our Civil Service and Labor Chair, Introduction 1604B, by uh, Chair Miller, would require the collection of workers' compensation data about occupational diseases to help keep our workers safer and healthier. This bill also requires each agency to develop and implement an annual accident and illness program designed to reduce workplace injuries and illnesses identified in the report and the mayor to submit a report on the steps the city will take to develop programs to mitigate occupation, injury, and illnesses. And the next bill is also by a Chair Miller. Uh, we have two more bills, Introduction 1786 and Introduction 1810, again, both sponsored by the Chair, that would extend health insurance coverage benefits specifically to the surviving spouses, domestic partners, and children of two city employees who were 
uh, very tragically killed while on the job. Matthew Jukabowski, who worked at the Department of Sanitation, was killed on September 24th, 2019. And Eduardo Calle Abril worked at the Department of Transportation and was killed on October 22nd, 2019. They were both killed while performing their official city duties. And I invite Councilmember Miller to come forward and speak on all three of these bills. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so uh, on, the, on the latter bills, obviously those are, are, are pretty self-explanatory in how we value our public employees and the services that they deliver. Um, but being able to continue to value them after they have given the ultimate, made the ultimate sacrifice and providing benefits for, for their family is something that we're doing here. Also something that um, we, in, in the future are looking to address that each time a member of the municipal workforce is is uh, killed in the line of duty that we're not coming in and and passing bills to make sure that their family have the bills that they so richly deserve um, with, with council members Cornegie's bill that is also kind of a, a no-brainer when we have uh, uh, corresponding agencies, in this case, workers, New York State Workers' Compensation and or the um, Social Security Disability um, have already um, provided benefits for disabled workers and NYSA should be cons consistent with that. And so that is the ask there. On um, 1604, when, this, when, when the law enabling the city's annual reports of uh, workers' compensation claims was passed in 2004. The council intended for the comp for this to be comprehensive and provide information that would help identify and eliminate poten potentially hazardous workplace conditions. But the report produced in the years since have yielded basic data and little benefits. The date of and to date the injuries and injured bodies body parts locations and counties while omitting nature of injury type of injury diagnosis descriptions of the injury occurred exposing deficiencies in the law itself introduction 1604 will ensure that the city gathers information extensive uh, amount of information on injuries and and spares no details more importantly it will, for the first time, also require the collection of information about occupational disease, as well as identifying injury illness patterns within specific titles, and compel the city to report annually on its efforts to coordinate with agencies on developing programs to reduce and prevent workplace hazards. The city's workers filed over 18,000 workers' compensation claims in 2018, costing the city more than $25 million $25 million. According to the city's controller, the city has spent over $345 million cumulatively on such current claims, and at the current rate, the city will pay $2.5 billion over the next decade. The passage of 1604 represents a win for our public servants and for our taxpayers alike. Unlike the previous law, legislation <clears throat> will result in data-rich report pri priorities, injuries and illness prevention, and help to save the city tens of millions of dollars. The knowledge gained through the revamped summary will improve our ability to understand how the city employees are getting hurt on the job, how the, the sickness, and enable I to identify the patterns within specific titles, and bring about Im improvements in the workplace ergonomics that can keep our workers healthy and safe. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson and members of the administration for supporting this legislation. Also like to thank uh, the council, Malcolm uh, B uh, Butenhorn, Nazat Chandri, and uh, my uh, legislative person, Brandon Clark. And I especially like to thank who I think is the, the foremost authority on, on, on on workplace and worker safety, and my good friend and former NICOSH Director Joe Schufel for keeping this issue at the forefront and what we've seen uh, over the past uh, this year and, and the work that we've done uh, with, with 9 11 and, and, and the others, and just the emphasis on workplace safety and, and workers. I want to thank you all, and, and Joe and my colleagues. I employ them to support this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, next up, we have a package of education bills that are aimed at holding the Department of Education accountable and increasing transparency. There are nearly 200,000 public school students who receive special education services in our city. This council hears too many stories from frustrated parents that their children are not getting the special education services they are entitled to. It's unacceptable, it's heartbreaking, and these bills will help keep the Department of Education accountable for providing required special education services. These are not options, and the DOE must help these families and these students. Uh, the first is, and I want to thank uh, Chair Traeger uh, for his incredible leadership on this. The first is introduction, proposed introduction 1380A, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, who I don't see here, uh, which would require the New York City Department of Education to annually report on special education claims by parents for reimbursement for tuition or services for the preceding academic year. The bill will report on the time frame for the process from initial submission of the claim by a parent to the DOE paying out on that claim. The bill would also require the department to report on the number of impartial hearing officers certified by the state to cover New York City, how many of the, those hearing officers had their certification revoked by the state, and how many cases hearing officers recused themselves from the cases. And I wanna uh, thank Councilor Rosenthal for this bill. Next is introduction, proposed introduction 1406A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, which would require the New York City Department of Education to annually report on several indicators regarding its evaluation of preschool aged children for special education services and the provision of such services. The bill also requires the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to annually report on its, on its provision of early intervention services for eligible infants and toddlers with disabilities. And I invite Danny to come and speak on this important bill. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any parent or teacher will tell you that addressing childhood learning issues as early as possible is the key to a child's future. When several leading education advocates shed light on how the city is serving our youngest students with special needs, I responded by introducing intro 1406A. This legislation will help deliver appropriate special education services and early intervention services to preschool aged children, helping to put them on the path to success. This legislation builds upon the council's pioneering effort to improve how our schools deal with special education services. Nearly five years ago, the council passed my bill, enacted as Local Law 27 of 2015, requiring the Department of Education to provide data on students receiving special education services. Intro 1406A builds upon this successful effort by requiring the department to report on preschool, special education, and early intervention services they currently offer. This report will help highlight current practices and track the department's progress towards special education for all eligible students, no matter how economically disadvantaged or otherwise hard to reach. Thanks to all my partners in this effort, especially advocates for children. I also want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, Chair Traeger, Mark Traeger as well, for the commitment to early childhood education in our city. And in 2015, after that first report came out, we found out that only 60% of students were receiving the uh, services that they were eligible for, 35% receiving partial services, and 5% were not receiving any services at all. Hopefully, this report on early childhood um, special education services will not find the same results. Uh, special education for years has been problematic in this city, and that's why we need to shine a light on what's actually going on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. Uh, next is proposed introduction number 900A, sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos, which would amend Local Law 27 of 2015 to require the Department of Education to report triannually rather than annually on its provision of special education services in compliance with students with IEPs. This bill would also add assistive technology services and special transportation services to the enumerated list of services that students with disabilities are entitled to on which the DOE is required to annually report. Uh, and I invite Ben to speak on this important bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member Ben Kalos. Our education system has been failing one in five children 
with disabilities by failing to give them the mandated services that they need. New York City Public Schools had 224,160 students with disabilities, uh, nearly 40,000 receiving only partial or none of their mandated services during the 2017-2018 school year. This led then public advocate, now Attorney General Letitia James to sue the Department of Education over their failure to track and thereby deprive disabled students of necessary assistance. That failure to track services cost New York City disabled students to lose out on $356 million in federal Medicaid reimbursements during the fiscal period of 2012 to 2014. In 2018, New York City released a report proving that this problem persisted, detailing that nearly the 40,000 special education students, roughly 22% of the students with special needs, received the special services and interventions they were entitled to. Many special needs students were found to have received no support whatsoever. James introduced Introduction 900 on May 9, 2018, and I was proud to co-sponsor this introduction then, and I am now even more proud to carry it to the finish line. This bill seeks to guarantee that students with disability receive the necessary services by increasing reports from annually and retrospective to three times a school year and expand what is reported to include speech therapy, counseling, occupational therapy, physical therapy, hearing education services, vision education services, assistive technology services. If a student is hard, is, has difficulty hearing or vision loss, not having their assistive technology on day one means they can't learn. And working with schools in my district like Clark, where children who are born with uh, hearing loss are taught to hear, they tell me of kids who are able to make it into DOE only to fall behind because they don't have that assistive technology that they need. In addition, we've been talking a lot about GPSs on school buses, particularly kids who have IEPs and a mandate for part of their special education, and this would also add the special transportation services. Instead of only having the data from the previous year, we'll finally be able to hold the DOE accountable to deliver services to children with disabilities while they are in school. Thank you to Tish James for taking this issue to court and authoring what will be a vital law. Thank you to our Education Committee Chair, Mark Traeger, and the committee staff for the work you've done on this intro. And a special thank you to Speaker Corey Johnson for making this bill package, passing today a priority, and focusing on students with disabilities in our public schools. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. It's always a good day when you wear that tie for kids in New York City. It's the special, it's the, it's the education tie. It's true. Yeah. Uh, next is proposed introduction 559A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, our chair, which would amend Local Law 27 of 2015 to require the Department of Education to disaggregate by school its report on individualized education program compliance rates, IEPs, and provide the number and percentage of students by school that are receiving the full services that they are entitled to and the chair has a resolution as well, resolution number 749A, which would call upon the Department of Education to create a chief compliance officer position within the department to ensure they are in compliance with the Federal Individuals with Dis Disabilities Education Act. This chief compliance officer would ensure that DOE is meeting its legal mandate to provide all special education services to a student with disabilities, which they're entitled to under IDAA, that bill, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And I want to invite Chair Traeger to come up and speak on uh, these two pieces of legislation and resolution, but also the entire package. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in February of this year, the committee held a hearing on the delivery of special education services to New York City public schools. At that hearing, we heard from parents, students, advocates, and special education providers, and we learned what we knew all along. The DOE is deficient in providing the legally mandated services that more than 200,000 students with disabilities are entitled to. We learned about a broken system that lacks needed transparency. We learned about the extraordinary steps parents and guardians must take in order for their children to get the most basic of educational services. As we've heard, nearly 20% of students in the school system are students with disabilities, or 224,160. To put that into better perspective, the Houston Independent School District, which Chancellor Carranza used to be superintendent of, has a total student population of 214,175 students. DOE reported 
in their latest special education report, thanks to Chair Drum's uh, report, uh, that only 78.4% of school age students with IEPs in DOE settings were fully receiving their recommended services. 19.1% were receiving partial services, and 2.5% didn't receive any services. Further, even more disappointing, in 2018, only roughly 50% of students with disabilities graduated from high school within four years. So when the mayor and the chancellor talk about graduation rates going up, what about kids with IEPs? I don't hear much about that. I acknowledge that DOE has tried to make some improvements, but we learned at the hearing there's so much work needed to be done to serve some of our city's most vulnerable kids. Today we begin that work. To the package of legislation we are voting on today will not only provide more granular level data on DOE's compliance with delivering special education services, but also a new level of reporting for preschool students and early intervention services. Together, these bills will provide parents, advocates, and policymakers in this council with the information necessary to hold the DOE accountable. I'm proud to have two pieces of legislation moving, uh, moving today. My bill, as mentioned by the speaker, 559A, will require the DOE to expand its current reporting on IEP compliance to the school level. That's important. We need to know what's happening at each school. Because as, as we saw with the PTA fundraising bill, there are certain schools, certain communities, certain zip codes with a lot of resources, and certain schools, and certain communities with very few resources. I need to see that pattern now in terms of IEP compliance. That will further tell a story about zip codes and equity in New York City public school system. Um, this will provide a more holistic picture of what is happening in our more than 1,800 schools. Finally, as the speaker mentioned, Resolution 749A encourages the DOE to create a special education chief compliance officer position to ensure students with IEPs are a priority and that the DOE is in compliance with federal rules and mandates. The chancellor has said that you know, everyone's responsible for compliance. I come from a school of thought, and I have a leadership degree. I was a teacher as well as, as Chair Drum was. And there was a saying in school, if everyone's responsible, then no one's responsible. At that hearing that, that I chaired, it was very sobering, where IEPs were changed without parents being notified. The DOE couldn't even tell me how many IEPs were translated into different languages at the request of families. We heard about the painful stories of families taking out home equity loans to pay for tuition uh, to private schools because the DOE can't provide accommodations within the public school system. The system is broken. And so we have a lot of work to do, but I thank the speaker and my, the committee staff and my staff for their help and leadership and their support in advancing these, uh, these very important bills today. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Thanks, Morris. Yeah. Uh, next is uh, proposed introduction number 1710A, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards. This bill would extend the J51 tax exemption and abatement program through June 30th, 2020, and would also raise the assessed value limitation on the units eligible for this program from $35,000 to $40,000. I want to invite uh, Councilmember Richards to come speak on this important bill. Thank you, Speaker, and I'm happy to be here today to speak on intro 1710A to renew the J51 incentive program, which provides tax exemption and abatements for property owners who convert or renovate their buildings, co-ops and condos, with so few opportunities to assess to access affordable home ownership in this city, it is critical that we provide as much incentives as possible to ensure that there is still an affordable path to ownership for our families, particularly in Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Staten Island. In the outer boroughs, many of these homes are the most affordable you can find in the city outside of subsidized programs, allowing thousands of families the opportunity to stop throwing their money away to landlords and gain some true equity. While we impatiently wait for the recommendations to reform the inequitable property tax system in New York City, we have to do everything in our power to limit the burden on our families across the city, which is why I'm so proud that we are able to renew this program for another year. I'd also point out that there are some improvements that can be made to this program at the state level to provide more protection for rent control tenants that live in some of these properties, which I am supportive of and hope to see Albany take up in their next session. 
In the meantime, though, it is very important to me, to my colleagues and I that represent many of these homeowners that we did not delay their access to these exemptions while we wait to see the protections added to the program. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, Council Members Gredenchik and Vallone, who were steadfast supporters of this renewal, as well as Megan Chen and Orji Sun in the Legislative Division. I'd also like to thank our colleagues in Albany for extending this home rule opportunity for us to take up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Donovan. And um, did I? I think I missed a bill. Hold on. I missed a bill by uh, Council Member Torres, which is proposed introduction number 948A, sponsored by Richie Torres. This bill would require the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development to select a list of 50 buildings based on certain factors that indicate the building owner has failed to comply with the heating requirements set forth in the Housing Maintenance Code. The bill would then require these owners to install an internet capable temperature reporting device in each dwelling unit for up to four years. The bill would also require HPD to conduct targeted inspections of buildings on the list every two uh, weeks for the duration of the heat season and uh, Richie is not here. And then uh, lastly, this next bill is something that addresses one of the biggest problems that we are facing as a city, and that is the crisis of homelessness. Introduction 1211A will require developers who receive city funds to set aside 15% of the units for those experiencing homelessness. This is a revolutionary change in policy that is both necessary and urgent. Close to 80,000 people are experiencing homelessness right now in New York City, including tens of thousands of children. This is not sustainable, and I am proud that we are taking this bold action today to address this existential threat to our city. I really, really, really want to thank uh, Councilmember Salamaka, who has been an incredible leader on this. Uh, he has been someone that has been working project by project, building supportive housing, building units of housing for formerly homeless individuals in his district, and he's had a lot of rezonings, uh, one-off building rezonings and bigger rezonings these last few years, and in every project, he was pushing for a larger set aside for homeless individuals who needed a permanent home. You will hear from him in a moment, and I really also want to thank, I think he would call them his partner in this effort, the uh, um, Housing of Our Future New York Coalition, which really helped push this monumental policy change over the finish line. So proposed introduction 1211A, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Salamanca, would require developers who receive city financial assistance for new construction of housing development projects to set aside at least 15% of dwelling units offered for rent in each housing development project for homeless individuals and families. The Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development would be required to report annually to the mayor and to the speaker of the council on the number of units set aside for homeless individuals and families in each city-financed housing development project and housing preservation project. And I congratulate Raphael and I invite him to come up and speak on this historic piece of legislation. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson. Homelessness in New York City is one of the greatest issues of our time. Across the city, homelessness affects New Yorkers of all ages, backgrounds, and within every community. As local leaders in our respective neighborhoods, we've heard the heart-wrenching stories that has led men, women, and children to turn to public shelters as a last resort. One of the most common themes we hear, I never thought it would happen to me. Despite all the well-intentioned policy initiatives, from different mayoral administrations, it was clear that, homeless, that the homelessness crisis was growing at a rate we could not keep up with. During this decade, the shelter population grew from 39,000 people in 2010 to over 62,000 people to their latest information. Recognizing the severity of the issue and seeing how homelessness impacted my community, it was apparent to me that we needed bold and ambitious legislation to change the way we thought about housing and homelessness. Last October, I introduced intro 1211, which required residential developments receiving city subsidies to set aside a minimum of 15% of units for homeless individuals and families. 
Determined to show that intro 1211 could work, I began instituting a 15% homeless set aside in projects within my district. Over the course of a year and a half, I was proud to have secured 121 set aside units for homeless individuals and families, proving that a 15% homeless set aside could work in multiple projects of varying sizes was important to show that intro 1211 could work across the city. And if we were truly going to address the citywide issue, it was critical that every borough and every community did their part. The daily advocacy from the House Our Future campaign played a significant role in leading us to this pivotal moment. Using their intensive analysis and research, it was evident that a 15% homeless set aside could work. We took our message to the administration and my colleagues and explained why the city needed policy with teeth to address the critical demand for permanent housing. While the administration needed some convincing, Speaker Corey Johnson recognized early on the necessity for homeless set-aside legislation. His support to intro 1211 was reflected in his commitment to ensuring negotiations remain ongoing and meaningful with the administration. Together, we advocated for and secured the language that would lead to the creation of thousands of units of permanent housing for the homeless. Supporting our efforts, a brilliant cast of city council personnel worked in intro 1211 throughout the process. And I want to give a big shout out to Jason Goldman, Raju Mann, Jeff Baker, Andrea Vasquez, Michelle Lee, Andre Sun, and Austin Bradford. And from my office, I want to give you know big kudos to uh, Brian and John and of course the Coalition for the Homeless and Vocal New York. On behalf of, the 60, of, of over the 62,000 New Yorkers who woke up this morning in a city shelter, I look forward to voting aye on intro 1211 later today. Thank you. Congratulations. And that is our agenda for today. I'm happy to take first on-topic questions. Anything on-topic? Rich. So we currently, as you know, spend billions of dollars on direct city subsidy for developments all across New York City. And the financing is different for every project. It depends on the size of the project. It depends if the project is going to have higher area median incomes in there, coupled with lower median income. So every project is slightly different on the level of subsidy the city is going to need to put in. On the, on the, with this bill, we're going to have to calculate this in both the financing for the property owner and developer, as well as the uh, city government, HPD, uh, that is going to have to partner with them and figure out the financing. So there will be an increase in some city monies that goes into these projects, which is necessary, but we think that that is actually worthwhile in getting the shelter population down, and it's cheaper to uh, have someone in a shelter than pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every month for a hotel room, which is not giving these families uh, a right way to be able to live and raise their children. So it's different project by project. There will be an increase in money. It's hard to know yet because we have to see what's in the pipeline. This goes into effect July 1st of 2020, but there will be an increase in city subsidy. Do you want to say anything, Rafael? Okay, thank you. Joe. I don't expect that because we are already spending a tremendous amount of right, money right now through the Department of Homeless Services and HRA. And so if you redirected some of that money out of managing homelessness and actually put it towards preventing homelessness, which this bill accomplishes, I think there's a way to re redirect existing money. The second part is, uh, we can't fully predict yet what's going to happen because it's going to be a deal by deal basis. But I don't think this is going to decrease the amount of affordable housing that's produced in New York City. It's going to change the financing package involved, and every financing package is unique building by building. And uh, 
people are still going to want to build. Uh, there's still going to be affordable housing that's built. Now this is going to ensure that these uh, families are able to live in every community in the city because these projects happen in every community in the city, and we're proud of that. Gloria, um, did you want to say anything on that? Oh, sorry, I apologize. You want to talk, respond to what Joe said? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I just just uh, just to go back to what the speaker was saying. You know, and when you do the research, at least some shelters in my council district to house a family, the city's paying about thirty six hundred dollars a month. Um, way and you know that does not the thirty six hundred dollars is not just for rent. Of course, it's for services. But I know for a fact that the city's paying way above market rate uh, for these apartments. Um, there are many families in the homeless shelters that are working. You know, and so they're just they're just waiting for that permanent apartment where they can pay 30 percent of their income uh, to cover the cost for 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 rent. And there's also many hundreds, if not hundreds of families who have housing vouchers and they just cannot get into these apartments because landlords are not taking them. So we're going to be working with DHS and HPD to ensure that those families that are ready for independent living are the ones that have access to these apartments immediately. Gloria? Do you want to take it? Well, we um we have a veto-proof bill, so you know I'm I'm excited about that. That we know that this bill will be will be actually a reality. Um, you know, to be honest, we started negotiating this bill since the inception when I introduced it, and the administration from the very beginning announced that they were not they were not supportive. Um, I had a few conversations with HPD. Actually, I had many conversations with HPD. We discussed the term sheets, uh, discussed different options, um, but they just were not budging. And so what I did in, my, in the background is I secured a, a veto-proof majority. I went and I spoke to my council members. Um, but I also worked closely with the advocates, you know, Coalition from the Homeless. They helped as well, a vocal New York. We had rallies. We had a sit-in during one of the stated meetings, you know, where we had a, a protest inside City Hall. Um, but finally, what really the last week and a half what got this over the finish line to be quite frank is speaker corey johnson you know we sat down with the speaker johnson and with the advocates and we said um corey we need to make this a reality you know um homelessness is increasing we need to get families into permanent housing and um we once we got his commitment um everything this this is why we're here today start yeah um so you know so you know briefly looking at the mayor's plan he's really addressing street homelessness to safe havens getting individuals off the streets and putting them into a shelter what separates that bill from my bill is that i m my bill takes individuals that are ready for independent living that are in a shelter and putting them into an, uh, a permanent apartment so let me let me take a crack at it so um I always think it's important when we're talking about homelessness in New York City, uh, given what a crisis we're in and how many New Yorkers are experiencing homelessness and how many New Yorkers who are not experiencing homelessness but are witnessing homelessness in New York City on a daily basis, that we, that we sort of separate these things out. And what I mean by that is, you heard the 62,000 number from Councilmember Salamanca. That's the number of individuals who are in a DHS shelter tonight. When you take the other shelters, DYCD, HPD, HRA domestic violence shelters, the number grows to almost 78,000 New Yorkers who are sheltered. But most New York City residents who are upset about homelessness that they're seeing, they're not seeing those individuals. 
they're not seeing the people in the shelter system. What they're seeing is the people who are living unsheltered on the streets of New York City, on the subways, who not uh, all of them, but many of them are really, really struggling, uh, have significant health challenges, uh, are in some instances decompensating before our very eyes, and are not getting the help that they need. And so the bill that the, the, the program that the mayor announced uh, earlier this week, I think seeks to aim chronic street homelessness. The last hope count had that number, I think, at around 3,600 people, though I think that's actually a low number. There's not, it's, not an, it's not a precise count the hope count does. Um, it's sort of, a, it's algorithmic in some ways. I think the number's higher than that. And one of the good things in the mayor's plan is we need a lot more safe haven beds. Safe haven beds are the lowest barrier towards getting people off the streets, not into a traditional shelter, but into a shelter setting that works for them to connect them to care. So the mayor's plan that talks about safe havens is great. We actually need a partnership uh, a public-private partnership on this. And what I mean by that is we, we're going to need the business community. We're going to need landlords. We're going to need people who own property in New York City to step up and actually make uh, storefronts and places available for safe haven beds. I've been trying to get one opened in my district on 14th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue in the last three years. And the community is now there after a lot of educating, but it's it's been some slow going on the administration side and getting it open for, I think, some, some bureaucratic hurdles that we're trying to overcome now. The real permanent solution, though, is in line with this bill that we're doing today. Because nothing is going to end homelessness unless you have permanent, low-income, and supportive, affordable housing for New Yorkers that are currently in shelter and need to transition out of shelter, or who are currently on the streets of New York City and won't go into a shelter, but need supportive housing for them. And so I think the mayor's plan is good on safe haven, but we need to see more permanent supportive housing built in New York City. That is the only thing that's going to turn the tide here. And it's not just the city government that's on the hook here. Uh, the, the governor announced a few years ago that he was putting together his supportive housing plan previously under the three previous New York, New York agreements. It was always a partnership between the city and the state on the number of supporting housing units they were going to build in the city and throughout the state on this last didn't, it wasn't a deal, New York, New York 4, you didn't see that partnership. And so you have the governor doing his plan separate from the mayor's plan. We really need coordination. And lastly, there's a bill in the state legislature by Councilmember Andy Hevesy called the Home Stability Act. And it's probably, I think, the most important bill that's before the legislature this session. And it goes to the heart of this on rental assistance vouchers, on getting more money for people experiencing homelessness, more money on supportive housing, expediting that money, speeding it up, targeting targeting it towards low-income people, helping people with mental health and substance abuse issues. That bill accomplishes that. There's a big price tag to it, but actually it's less than what we're paying now on managing homelessness right now. So I think it's a nice first step on safe haven. We need to do a lot, a lot better on permanent affordable housing. Jeff. Um, that's not true. That's not true. I don't know. It's the first time hearing that. When do they say that? He said it earlier. He said he called the legislature. That's why the legislature he called it a consultation. Um, uh, the, rea <laughs> the reality is that look, um, one of the reasons why this bill came up, um, I realized that not all communities were doing their fair share in addressing homelessness. Um, and, you know, some of my colleagues were really put in a bind when they go to community boards, and community boards are just rejecting, uh, shelters are just rejecting homelessness um, a as is. And so by codifying this bill into law, basically it would help my colleagues out as well, where when they go to the local community boards and there is pushback from the local community, they can say, this is law. There's nothing we can do about the 15%. Let's negotiate the other 85% uh, of the bill. Look, look the, the mayor deserves, uh, I think, a, a significant amount of credit on his affordable housing plan, which he ran on in 2013, in which he has championed, and I think, universal pre-K and the amount of preserved affordable housing and newly constructed affordable housing is a major bright spot for his administration and his potential legacy. But if this was a codification, why did they fight the bill? I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Anyone else? Off topic. Yeah, Sydney. Thanks. 
So we understand why people are frustrated with the slow pace in getting the recommendations out, and, and, and I share that frustration, but this is an enormously, enormously complicated issue, and the Commission is committed to releasing serious and thoughtful proposals. I have talked to the commissioners. They have taken this job very, very seriously. I actually think there are some very good, exciting proposals that I've gotten a sneak peek and a preview on. Uh, but the property tax system is so broken, it's going to take a lot of work to fix it. And I don't want to uh, get this out ahead of them feeling comfortable with it. I will also say that I'm not sure I'm going to agree with everything they're going to recommend. But I want them to put recommendations out. There can be a debate here in the council. There can be a debate in Albany. Ultimately, Albany is going to need to act on this. You've seen the state senate who have started some fact-finding hearings on the property tax commission without any recommendations themselves, but going out and listening to communities where there is deep inequity in our property tax system. This takes time. My understanding is there is an agreement on a number of points uh, between the commissioners. Uh, uh, but they, um, there are some things that are holding it up. I think they are close to releasing the preliminary report. It's not going to happen before the end of this year. It's my hope that it's going to happen in January. I actually feel pretty comfortable with where things are, um, and, and I continue to talk to the commissioners. When did you hear from them? Do they have some type of like internal report um, that they put together? Yeah, they, I mean, I think they almost have the preliminary report entirely done. Um, I've been talking to my appointees to the commission. Uh, the staff here, Latanya McKinney, our finance director, and Ray Majeski, our chief economist, are ex officio members of the Property Tax Commission. We have a great chair, uh, Mark Shaw, who I think has done a wonderful job. I have talked to him multiple times. I've talked to the two council uh, personnel who are part of the commission. I think it's in a pretty good place. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying I'm going to endorse everything, but they have done a damn good job on working on this. All the commissioners have. Even people that I don't know have really taken this seriously. They've met many, many times, and uh, I think we need to get the report out. I hope so, but it's not really the commission who has to make those changes. It's the state legislature. And that's why it's important that we release the report, get the recommendations out, so that they will have time to actually debate things. Uh, I, I, I think it's highly unlikely that it will get fixed this legislative session because the issue is so complicated, but there is a possibility that it could be tackled during the 2021 legislative session, and I think it's, it's an important thing, and I hope that we make uh, some very significant changes by the time I'm done being speaker. Who else? Sean. Yeah, you know, um, I have never been shy, as you know, about calling the MTA out and also calling the city out when, when we need to be doing a better job on funding mass transit. Uh, we had a hearing on this topic yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to review the testimony yet, but I will. I I'm committed, and I've talked about this a lot, in making it easier for people with disabilities or mobility impairments or older adults in getting around New York. And in many ways, this program, this on-demand program, has been a victim of its own success. Uh, my colleagues uh, call called for the good parts of the success ride program to expand, and now the MTA is suggesting cuts over funding questions. So this is all confusing, and what I mean by that is we had a hearing three weeks ago with the MTA leadership upstairs, uh, Chairman Foy, who I think is a very good person, and uh, we were talking about the MTA's capital plan, which is over $50 billion, and the city's putting in a huge chunk of that money. If you have an inaccessible subway system, which our subway system is, it is, it is a requirement on the MTA to provide transportation services to people with mobility impairments and disabilities. That currently isn't happening because of an inaccessible subway system. So the MTA needs to figure this out. They can't come to us for money. The, the, they have a huge capital budget they just voted on. They need to figure out, reprioritize, have transparency in that capital budget to figure out how they're going to pay for this. Not at this point. If the on-demand program works, which I know is very expensive, 
not at this point. We give them enough money. We did the, uh, what was the subway action plan we, we put the money in. We're putting almost all the money in on congestion pricing uh, tolling. We put money in through people buying uh, the fares, the New Yorkers. We put money in through taxes. So they can figure out how to pay for this. They need to figure out how to pay for this. It's part of their job. They have to be in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're not through the subway stations, so they have to be through Access Right On Demand. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, President Trump uh, is an embarrassment to New York, and uh, last night was a really solemn night for the country in taking the steps to impeach him, and I'm glad to see what the House did. Uh, and while the House was taking on a solemn responsibility under our Constitution, he was in Michigan saying that John Dingell, the longest serving member of the U.S. House of Representatives, is in hell. And so he is a, uh, a very bad person. He's a crook, he's a criminal, he's a serial harasser. And uh, I think that this bill uh, is an exciting bill. I will follow it through the legislative process. I haven't been briefed by staff on it or talked to Councilmember Levine. But I do think that if you have someone who consistently has had to settle with the Attorney General and with the courts over bilking taxpayers at our expense, we should figure out if we need to continue these contracts with the President of the United States, who I think has violated the Emoluments Clause of the U.S. Constitution. So. I think it's an exciting bill. Don't know all the details yet. We'll follow it through the process. Joe. Did you have any reaction to the, the DOI report on the uh, Yeshiva investigation that has been basically going on for uh, a number of years and they found that there was some sort of fraud that they could have uh, made some kind of investigation? I think it's important that um, all young people in New York City get a, a sound, high-quality, good education. And uh, I have not had a chance to read the DOI report at this point. Um, I, I will review it carefully. Um, I saw something in there that said that potentially it was delayed because of, uh, I think. Is it a mayoral control thing? Yeah, and, and I, it, you know, we need to release these things in the time they should be released. That's what should have happened. Rich. Well, uh, it, it was unacceptable and uh, frankly um, wrong for the city when this happened almost a month ago to claim that this was because of potential cooking grease or people cooking with certain products that cause this. And now we see that the DEP has now admitted that this is because of a pipe collapse, which has caused the backup in all of these homes in South Ozone Park. And uh, we have to be really careful in the aftermath of these um, events that happened, emergencies that occur, that we are um, thoughtful and precise with the information that we have. I try to do that. I mean, maybe I make mistakes sometimes, but I try to do that during the blackout. I was trying to make sure that the information I had was corroborated from uh, people who had the information. On this, they seem to jump the gun a little bit. And, and of course, people in that community are angry. There are still problems every single night up there of continual backups, and we need to get out there. I know DEP is working hard on it, but we have to rectify this as quickly as possible. Yes, Gloria. The local, the local elected officials, Congressman uh, Nadler, State Senator Hoyleman, Assemblymember Gottfried, Borough President Brewer, and myself have been united in wanting to get something done, but also seeking consensus with the tenants who live at the Robert Fulton houses. And I think over the last uh, two months of a working group meeting on a nearly a weekly basis, there has been actually a lot of really good progress in working with the uh, tenants and residents and tenant leaders at the Robert Fulton houses on what they are uh, okay with and what things 
they find to be unacceptable. I think we've made a lot of really good progress. I feel good about the direction that we're heading, and I'm going to continue to work with my uh, colleagues on the local level, as well as the tenant and resident leaders at the Fulton Houses in getting something done here. But we're not close to being done, though I think we've actually made incredible progress in the last three months, more than I think many of us even expected, and I want to keep that momentum up. No. Can you talk a little bit about what the, you said No final decisions, but I think the direction that people are heading in is uh, willing to build some buildings that uh, on some of the uh, underutilized property at the Fulton Houses, and then using some of that money uh, for the upgrades needed to the buildings, the elevators, the roofs, everything that's talked about, the capital needs at Fulton Houses. The elected officials locally still have a significant concern on the demolition of that building on uh, 9th Avenue. And uh, we are still talking about the rental assistance demonstration program, which is a federal program, and figuring out if there's a way to do it uh, in partnership with nonprofit developers instead of for-profit developers, or maybe a program of nonprofit and for-profit. There's no final decision. But these are the really good conversations that are happening. We've allowed the space for these conversations to happen. I think it's been really great. No final decisions. Uh, things could change. But I'm really happy with the uh, collegial manner and the respectful manner that all all of the local elected officials, the administration, NYCHA, some of the outside experts who work on these issues, as well as the resident leaders, have spent over the last few months taking this into consideration. Any? Ask, yes. Do you happen to see a story, say, I found Public and Jonah has spent several thousand dollars from uh, a brand new spin to announce where we are, the ones who were bussed in about two weeks ago. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I mean, I, I didn't see the story, and no one should be accepting money from the Gambino crime family. So in Jonah's case, he's indicated that he will not, so far he says he won't return the money. Would you call on him to return the money? I think that anyone who takes money from anyone associated with organized crime should return the money. Any final questions? Thank you. Going once, going twice, goodbye.